What's up, gangsters? It is a, another fine, sunny fall afternoon in November this time. Uh, the last time that I came to talk about my Hasegawa Machine Krieger Falka project, it was September and football season was just about to start. And my, oh my, how things can change in two months. Uh, if you follow American football and particularly if you're a Dallas Cowboys fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But Tony Romo came back today and the Cowboys won after a losing streak of seven games. So I am in a much better mood and today was a good day to make a video. I'm also in a pretty good mood because I finished the Falca and uh, I have lots of things to say about it. Um, I just did that part, in fact, and it took me about 30 minutes. So um, we better get into it because I don't want to keep you guys here forever. Uh, without any further ado, then, let's take a look at what I managed to accomplish with this thing. Okay, so there you go, a few pictures of the Machining Krieger Falka. Now let's, uh, uh, let me walk you through some of the things that uh, happened along the way to <laughs> getting to those pictures. Um, it was not as smooth as I thought it would be, um, but let's start with uh, the good stuff first. Uh, when I Left off with the last video clip. I had the uh, the cockpit uh, pretty much assembled um, and ready to go together. Uh, the engine was not completely done uh, and it wasn't painted yet. And um, as you can see, of course, now it is. And um, I have to say that overall, the engine is one of the things that I, I'm both happiest with and most frustrated with. <laughs> uh, it was a lot of fun doing all the detail work on it and uh, I learned a lot. I, I tried some things that I picked up from Diego Quijano's Encyclopedia of Aircraft Modeling Techniques and uh, I feel like the overall effect was pretty good but there were definitely some things about it that I wasn't happy with. Um, and it's, as usual, mostly my fault. Uh, this was the first time that I had done anything uh, with a jet nozzle. And so, you know, coming up with kind of the right shades of blue there uh, was a little bit difficult. But I did some oils on that uh, on top of Tamiya uh, Clear Blue. And I'm pretty happy with the way that that all turned out. Um, but where I got stupid was that I mixed up this color uh, this overall uh, engine casing color to try and get a kind of a, of a titanium look. 
And um, what I did is I mixed some uh, burnt umber oil with some all clad, which, you know, by, you know, by, by logical paint chemistry theory should work just fine. Um, and it does, but the problem is, is that even with uh, uh, only the amount of oil paint in there that it took to get to the tone that I wanted, it still took forever to dry and it wasn't a very strong surface coat. And I had some issues with that and the surface finish in certain areas, especially back here, is is not what, what I'd like it to be. So next time, I'll just order myself some titanium colored paint and not try to mix my own, at least not that way. Um, but hey, you know, that's just one of those lessons. Uh, you know, you, you live and learn and uh, go on about your business. One thing that I was pretty happy with that turned out as I envisioned with the engine was uh, using lead wire and brass to create some uh, tubing and fittings. And that's pretty difficult to see now, but if you can kind of see down in there, uh, there they are. Um, I was pretty happy with the way that worked out. I got myself some tubing from uh, Albion, and I found that if you roll it underneath the edge of your hobby knife blade, that with some practice, you can get pretty clean cuts and make some pretty nice little fittings. And of course, lead wire is always pretty easy to work with and makes great looking tubing, so that's, uh, that's always a good solution. Um, kind of moving towards the front, um, the, uh, the cockpit is probably the next thing uh, because as I had mentioned in my video, last video clip, I was uh, going to uh, get some aftermarket seatbelts for it and you can see those right in there. And I, I'm pretty happy with the way those turned out. Those uh, came from a little place called um, m and Hobbies, and if I remember right, these are called Tuner Model Factory uh, seat belts. And what's a little bit different with them is that they, uh, the material, uh, and you can get it in two or three different colors, is actual nylon, which is great, but it comes in a sheet. And there's two disadvantages to that. One is that you have to cut it in nice straight strips that are the correct width, which is not a lot of fun and you don't get any surface detail um, like stitching. Uh, I tried to approximate the stitching by just drawing on it with a with a, an HB pencil and that worked okay. It's at least a suggestion of those details. Um, so overall I think it's pretty good but one other issue that you that I had with it is that um, the edges will fray on you pretty easily and if you were to look super close um, you may be able to see them on camera there's a few places where the little tiny fibers are sticking out there and um, that definitely takes away from the appearance but overall a pretty good product especially for 10 bucks the photo etch itself is fantastic um, you won't be able to see it there but the detail on the photo etch is really good and you also get a nice piece you can see oops uh, you can a nice piece that you can see down in there uh, that represents the uh, the center latch. It's that black piece that's down there in the bottom and that's a nice injection molded plastic piece that's uh, that's pretty cool. So overall, again, especially for 10 bucks, I think that they are a, a really a, a neat um, a neat detail product that really helps bring things to life because without a, without a set of seatbelts, this cockpit's just not very lively. There you go, another another view of the cockpit. Okay, so those are things that uh, I feel overall pretty good about. Pretty happy with the way that they turned out, but overall, uh, <laughs> this thing, I, I, I feel kind of like I, uh, I got away with some stuff um, where it looks okay from the right distance, but uh, in truth, some of it is the result of me uh, just not having good skills and, as usual, making piss poor decisions. And the uh, it started, like I said, with the uh, with the 
with the paint on the engine and that kind of kind of screwed up my whole uh, my whole vision for this thing because I was originally intending to make this thing as pristine everything shiny and perfect and that certainly did not did not work out and even before that started even before I, I uh, actually went to painting the engine because as I discovered once I put primer on it I had made a horrible mistake uh, well before that and that was when I went and glued down my photo etch now I'm a serial over gluer and I know that and I try not to be but I tried something different uh, with this photo etch um, because I felt like I just I have this paranoia about parts being weak and falling off even though I know they're never going to and so with this photo etch I tried using some extra thin CA glue um, and that was a big mistake because not only did it not flow where I wanted it to but the uh, evidence of it uh, once I put some primer on was horrible I mean it looks like I mean, it, honestly, it looks like it looks like a kindergartner smearing paste all over a piece of construction paper. And fortunately, the worst offender is on the bottom here, and you can't really see it too much. But just bad decision making and bad bad uh, process on my part, and I definitely won't do that again. Now, the next thing with the paint was potentially much much worse. Um, my intent with this thing was to use the rest of this bottle of House of Color Cosmos Red Urethane. Now, this is uh, automotive paint. Uh, it's pretty popular with guys that do custom airbrushing on helmets, motorcycle tanks, things like that. And it's a base coat, clear coat system. So it goes down matte and uh, it really needs to be put on top of a silver base coat to really bring out the luster in it. And then you have to put a gloss clear on top of it to uh, make it shine. And it's what I used on my uh, 132nd Tamiya Mustang Red Bull Racer. And I had great success with it. Um, it was tough as nails withstood all sorts of masking tortures um, beautifully. And so I thought, hey, everything will be fine. Um, and for the most part, it was. I primed this thing with Steinal Res. Then I laid on a, a nice thick coat of all-clad aluminum, and everything was great up to that point. I had some issues um, uh, with all of the various curved surfaces on this. And you guys know sometimes this happens at wing roots where you get paint particles bouncing around in places like this and giving you a kind of a nubbly uh, appearance. And I had to go back and sand some of that off. But I also discovered that if I blasted it afterwards with a quick hit of straight lacquer thinner from my airbrush, that that helped knock down some of the fuzz. So. I got uh, all the way through uh, the primer, the silver base, and then the red base uh, without any issues to speak of uh, as far as I knew. Now, <laughs> my original plan was to lay out these stripes and do the numbers underneath the clear coat. But as I was starting to lay down the tape for the stripes, I had a piece of tape sticking here, and I mean, it was just barely laying there. I hadn't even rubbed it down, and it was in the wrong position, and when I pulled it to adjust it, it popped off a little piece of red paint. I mean, like, super easy. And so, I knew immediately that my uh, base coat had a problem, that there, were, you know, for some reason it wasn't bonding well to, uh, to the silver. And that may be my own fault, because when I picked up this bottle to, uh, to use it, I discovered that after six months of sitting on the shelf that it had started to um, thicken up, and basically half of it was, had evaporated. Now, you can dilute this stuff with lacquer thinner, and so I just basically refilled the bottle with some straight lacquer thinner and brought it back to life and everything, as far as I knew, was fine. But that may have something to do with the fact that it didn't bond well to the all-clad. That's the only explanation I've got because that's the only thing that was different from the last time that I used it when it was tough as nails. So 
Uh, who knows? Um, but, uh, you know, I patched that spot, changed my strategy to putting everything, you know, the stripes and the numbers on top of the clear coat, which I didn't really want to do, but uh, I decided, you know, it is what it is. And I decided to make the stripes flat as a contrast to the gloss. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's, that's okay. But the drama was not over. <laughs> Because once I got the gloss coat on, and for the gloss, I used my, uh, my favorite, uh, let me dig it out here, uh, used my favorite automotive gloss product, which is this Upal Clear Urethane. Now... Um, this stuff is fantastic. It's what car guys use, and it'll give you a true wet look gloss if you spray it correctly. And, and that's actually not too hard to do because it is pretty forgiving. And these guys, I mean, look at this. They give you the best instructions right here on the side of the can. Um, I mean, how much more clear can you get? Mix it four to one, sand it, you know, going from 600 to 1,000. Here's the pressure, here's the number of passes, here's how long it takes to dry. It's, it's good stuff, very toxic. You definitely don't wanna even think about using it without having a, a, a good ventilating system and a, uh, and a respirator on. But at any rate, um, I, I got the whole thing sprayed and um, I guess actually while I'm telling you that, I should also tell you about one of the other challenges because I had mentioned when I was uh, going through the last video that I wanted to try and figure out a way to put the engine in after I did all the paint because uh, it would be much easier, obviously, to do the paint without having to mask all that off. Well, I decided that I figured out a good strategy of covering it with saran wrap and paper and tape and it wasn't too hard to mask it off. But what I discovered is, and I should have thought, should, should have realized this before, I got to that point was that uh, there's no place to grab this thing. Um, it's not an issue if you're painting this with like a military finish and you can paint the top and then flip it over and paint the bottom because all the colors are flat and they're very forgiving. But with a gloss, you got to paint the whole thing in one go. Everything's got to be wet uh, for the best results. And so I had built this huge contraption that involved a pieces of wood and a socket wrench and basically it plugged into the tailpipe here and was glued to the bottom of the engine and and basically I built myself a rotisserie so that I could spin this thing around as I was painting it and that uh, actually uh, worked pretty good um, and I got the clear coat on there and um, it looked pretty decent um, had a, a couple of places where it was a little bit grainy, um, and I just started polishing. And um, I've done a separate uh, a video on, on how to polish a clear coat, so I won't go through all the details with that. But basically, I did the polishing with the Nova system and uh, a buffing wheel on my little Proxon, which is another one of my favorite tools. And that was a shit ton of work to put it in precise terms um, I probably had six or seven hours in polishing the thing and it was a lot of work but I feel like the the results were pretty good I mean it's it's not perfect but it's definitely got a a nice uh, show car gloss on it and uh, that's when I ran into the major bit of drama with the paint now I had uh, uh, I was was had masked off the um, I don't know what you what you call them but these gizmos on the bottom right here I had them all I had masked all around them so that I could spray them with some uh, with some nice uh, Vallejo metal color steel which is. Uh, something else that's worth mentioning. I just happened to be in the middle of doing a test of that stuff and I had all of the colors right here on my bench and I used those in quite a few places. 
Anyway, uh, not to get sidetracked, I, I got all that done and I was pulling the masking tape off. And I was even thinking as I was doing it uh, that I didn't need to be too worried about it because I had this ultra tough clear coat on there. And uh, um, the masking was coming up fine. I, I was, I know, I was being careful, but I wasn't paying as much attention as I normally do. And I ripped a chunk of masking tape off of the side right down here uh, that was bigger than my thumbnail right down to the silver paint just popped right off and it was one of those things that happened so fast and I was just kind of like oh holy shit I can't even believe what I'm looking at here uh, you know and it's particularly embarrassing from the guy who made the video about how to properly remove masking tape so uh, you know, it just goes to show that you can never, ever let your guard down with masking tape. Um, but at any rate, um, I didn't have any choice. I had to sand that area uh, down a little bit, uh, respray it with some of the red base coat, re-clear coat it, and repolish it. And that all came out pretty good, not too bad. Um, but I already knew that I was in trouble as far as uh, the strength of the paint goes and that's when I decided okay fine let's just go with the flow here and instead of trying to make this thing all pretty pretty let's make it like a racer that has seen some use and let's just do some chipping <laughs> and then it actually turned into fun because I found that with a 240 grit sanding stick and some various other things that I could knock the paint off in a very realistic way. And uh, you can see some of that right here. Uh, you know, I like that. I mean, I, I prefer actual physical abuse when at all possible because it's always going to be more realistic than trying to paint your chipping on. And of course, I had no chipping fluid or anything involved here. So uh, I, I was actually pretty pleased with that part. Um, uh, but... To continue on with the drama, um, I got the clear coat all polished out. I, I don't know if I mentioned, I think I had six or seven hours of polishing time in it. Yeah, by the time I got to where I was ready to lay out and paint this white stripe, which I did, um, and which went fairly well. I just used some uh, Model Master flat white enamel. And I was being very, very careful when I was removing the masking tape, because I knew and I had all of the masking tape off and I had the piece that created this edge right here, the last piece. I had it pulled back all the way until, guess where? Right here. And it popped off a half inch long section of paint. Um, actually, I, I had already popped one off right there uh, by the, you can see it right there by the stripe on the, on the nose there. But I decided that one could just be damaged. At any rate, I had this gigantic rectangular chunk of paint missing right there. And so <laughs> that's one of those times where you've got some decisions to make. You know, was I going to try and maintain a clean edge on that stripe and repair that, you know, by painting it and, and clear coating it and repolishing it, which I did not give myself very good odds for, uh, or was there a creative solution? And I uh, fortunately slept on it and when I came into the bench the next morning I was just kind of looking at this thing and I had originally intended to put the numbers on both sides right here and then I got to thinking you know I kind of like things that are asymmetrical I've already got this asymmetrical stripe and if I put a larger decal on here and I had these decals left over uh, from when I did my Mustang these are actually some of my custom printed ones um, but at any rate, I just decided, you know what, I could just cover up that spot and make it look like that's how it was <laughs> supposed to be uh, in the first place. So that's going to be our secret. Uh, you guys are the only ones who know that this right here was not intentional. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully it all looks pretty good. Speaking of decals, I did use some of the actual kit decals from Hasegawa. Um, right here on the side and uh, a couple of them up here on the nose and I got to say again these decals were really good very little carrier film very thin went down perfectly um, 
Got to hand it to, to Hasegawa on, on that score for sure. Good decals. Now, there is one other bit of, uh, of skullduggery that took place here that uh, uh, didn't really go as planned, and that was right here. My original intent was to put a piece of bare metal foil on this panel on both sides. And uh, as I was working it and, and going through the first piece of it that I did not get smoothed down uh, well enough without any huge wrinkles, I very quickly discovered that bare metal foil will also yank this paint off very quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, that's why we have this major chip here. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to just make it like it's a single panel that had to be replaced and there's some obvious damage around it and just go with it. That's, you know, at that point I was just like, I, I, I've just got to cut my losses here. <laughs> so that's my story on that. And, uh, I'm sticking to it. Um, but, you know, this whole thing has really been uh, one of those deals where sometimes you got to just go with it and uh, hope that things turn out for the better, and sometimes they actually do, uh, or at least not for the worse. And here's a good example of that. Um, this little antenna right here. So this was originally supposed to be just straight. <laughs> And I could not keep from touching it because I was an idiot and put it on before I had put on a couple of other parts right towards the end. And uh, I was furious because it was looking, uh, I wasn't happy with the way that it was looking. And at one point I had flipped this thing over to do what I'm about to talk about. And this cockpit lid had popped open and I had hit the thing in just such a way to knock it over the edge of the cockpit rim and then somehow managed to slam the cockpit on top of it and put that little bend in it. And <laughs> I knew when it happened, I was like, okay, it's, it's done for. I'm going to have to yank it off of there and, and replace it. But when I took a second look at it, I decided, you know what? It actually doesn't look too bad. I think I'm just going to leave it like that. There's, you know, there's a point where you're just basically asking for trouble if you keep messing with stuff. So at any rate, uh, this thing has been uh, quite an exercise in just going with the flow and letting the uh, creative direction sort of evolve as conditions dictate. Um, and that's definitely what happened on the bottom here. Um, I'm not going to hold it this way for too long, but... Um, you can see that I got uh, definitely in the spirit of making this thing look, uh, you know, like it had been used and grimy. Um, you know, on the bottom side, I, we don't know exactly how high these anti-gravity cars fly, but I think it's safe to say that the bottom of it would be pretty filthy after a race. And so I decided that uh, I was going to do a couple of things to give it that appearance. Um, one was using some black washes around the, uh, the, the rear in, end of it, around the engine parts and so forth. But then I thought, okay, how am I going to get that sort of overall grime look underneath? And um, my initial strategy uh, was to, I, I, I hit the whole bottom of it with a layer of dull coat. Um, I thought, hey, that's lacquer. It'll stick to it. Nothing's going to stick to this gloss paint. And um, so I just kind of dusted that on there. I did it kind of from the front so that it would be coming from the right direction. And then I came with a very light enamel wash on top of that. And it looked pretty good. I felt happy about it. But I discovered the next day after only very minimal handling to finish up a few details that it, was, it, was not, it wasn't going to work. It was a total disaster because it was just coming off. Um, I mean, if I looked at it funny, it rubbed off. And um, at that point, I was pretty pissed off and not at all happy about the situation. But again, I slept on it. And so uh, the next morning I came in and discovered that with a little bit of uh, isopropyl alcohol on a rag that I could very easily wipe off most of the mess that was on the bottom. And actually, in some places, the remnants of it left an even cooler and more realistic effect 
for the grime and the and the gunk that was down there. And then I came back and I just did the same uh, thing where I dusted on a very thin layer of gray. And what I used this time is Steinal Res, which seems to stick pretty well to just about everything. So um, I thinned it about 90%. I don't know if, if it'll, you know, it probably wouldn't stand up to a whole lot of handling, but um, it's, the thing is done, and so it can just sit there and cure out forever as far as I'm concerned. Um, that was definitely one of those deals where uh, sucking it up and redoing it was definitely the right thing to do. So lots of things tried, uh, not all very successful, uh, but definitely lots of things learned in this project. Uh, one last thing to talk about that was tried and was pretty successful and did involve some learning was this section right here. Uh, if you're familiar with this kit, you know that normally it has a gun right here and some other gizmos and things, and um, that's all pretty cool, but for this racer, I didn't want any of that, and so I chopped all of that off. And once I made the decision to just leave this structure the way it was, because I was initially thinking about filling it in and rounding it off and doing all kinds of things. Oh, there's another scuff mark. It's a bug splatter. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, I was going to initially sort of fill all this in and round it off, but I decided that, that was going to be uh, probably more difficult than I wanted to tackle. And so I had to try and make this look good. And, and down here, it had a sharp corner and a seam on both sides. Um, let me see if I can sort of zoom in there a little closer um, and tilt it a little bit so that you can see it. Um, anyway, right in here, it was a sharp corner and there was a seam there. And that's obviously a place where you don't want to have to try and get in there and do a bunch of sanding because uh, you just can't. And so what I did is I... Uh, I mixed up some uh, epoxy, which is two-part epoxy putty sculpting material that uh, can be moved around with water for about two or three hours after you initially mix it. Um, I say mix it, it actually is more like kneading some dough because you, you know, you, you kind of peel it out of the cans in a chunk and then work it with your fingers until you've got a ball of it. And um, I smushed some of that in there, and then I used a wet paintbrush to smooth it down and give myself a basic fillet there uh, to define the shape and get rid of the seam. And that was okay, but I knew that it wasn't going to be perfectly smooth. So what I did then is I knew from all of the times that I have poured all clad 309 micro filler primer into this cup that it dries to a glossy, smooth finish if it's thick enough. And I thought, aha, I have me an idea. And I did, in fact, exactly that. I just took a paintbrush and very carefully flooded that area in there all the way across and uh, did it three or four times until basically it did exactly what it, you saw in that cup and created that really nice, smooth, rounded surface in there. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way that turned out because that had the potential to be not only very difficult, but uh, difficult to make look any kind of good. So pretty happy with the way that part of it turned out. And overall, you know, I guess that even though I'm not happy that I had so many close calls because I would like to think of myself as a good enough craftsman not to get myself into those situations um, that, uh, it, you know, overall that it did turn out pretty good and that the combined effect is is nice and I can be happy about it. Um, you know, it uh, it's hard to make things that are glossy. That's just, uh, at least for me anyway, um, there's a reason why so many of us prefer to do military stuff. I think we just inherently know that that's... Uh, uh, got lower penalties, especially if you're doing a bunch of weathering. So, uh, you know, I kind of had to let my creative vision evolve um, based on the conditions and things that were happening, uh, some of which was, you know, self-induced drama, self-inflicted gunshot wounds. But also some of it was because of just other things going on, you know, because I've been doing this test with these Vallejo metal color paints. 
I was able to use those quite a bit. Um, these pieces right here are uh, painted in Vallejo. Uh, I believe those are gunmetal gray. Same thing with this part right here. All of the engine bits on the bottom are painted with the Vallejo uh, metal color paints. And I have to say, um, so far, they are fantastic paints. Uh, so, again, just part of kind of going with the flow and letting things work themselves out as they would and taking advantage of uh, of every available thing to try and bring, you know, to, to try and bring this thing to life. So there you have it. That's the whole long story. Okay, so there you go. There is the whole sordid, drama-filled story of the Machine and Krieger Falca. <laughs> And uh, what an adventure it was. Um, I was super excited about building one of these things uh, when I got it, and it was a lot of fun. But as is sometimes the case, it was also a lot of stress because I had this idea in my head of what I wanted to do, and uh, I thought that I knew the things that I needed to know to get to that creative vision, but... Uh, as you heard there, um, I was uh, maybe a little naive in that respect. Um, I think that I made a major mistake. Uh, when I got these, I actually got two of them. I've got a griffin sitting right down here as well. And I was so excited about building something different that I wanted to do something glossy because I'd been doing nothing but military stuff for a while. So I decided to do this one first. And I, I really think that was a mistake because... I should have started out with the military one and been able to get through the whole build in basically the same fashion as I would have with a military model. But what I did instead by picking this strategy is I took a completely unfamiliar kit that I had never built before and basically turned it into a glossy car model. <laughs> so maybe not the best decision making but hey that's how we do it here at Rube Goldberg Enterprises so uh, it is what it is lots of things learned and uh, I think you know at the end of the day um, it all turned out okay but next time I get excited about something like that I'll definitely know better um, as far as the kit itself goes lots of fun very cool very few issues Hasegawa did a great job with this thing, and um, you know, if you're looking for something that gets you outside of the normal thing, um, you know, especially if you're a military modeler and you're used to planes and tanks and things, you know, this could be something that you might enjoy. Whoops, look, we got a little cat fight drama going on back here. Hold it down, girls. I'm in the middle of something important, <laughs> but not really. Anyway, let me just now shut my mouth and uh, call it good. Um, hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed this look at something a little bit different. All right? If you put up with me for this long, as always, I definitely appreciate it. All right, guys? Much love.